welcome to the block party. And we have a really special Ernie's Corner tonight because, you know, that gold mine issue has been, I'm looking on Facebook and there is such a great response to that. So I have Ernie Sheffalo and Ivor Levine, contributing editor. Guys, so glad to have you here on the corner. Thank you. Nice to be here. Yeah, it's great to be here, Joyce, and, and it's great to have Ivor on with me because he's really, you know, you talk about Goldmine Magazine and, and the buzz and everything that's going on about it. He's a big, he's responsible for a big part of that. I mean, he, he put the idea together. I didn't really have any idea of what he was doing, and he wouldn't tell me. He's one of these guys who keeps his cards close to the chest. And even when he would already in print, he wouldn't send me stuff that I could read. He sent it to me so small when I tried to blow it up, it was all pixelated. And he said, no, no, you got to read it when you get the magazine and hopefully we can be together. But, uh, you know, Ivor, thank you so much, man, for, for everything that you did, because without you, it wouldn't happen. Well, you know, I appreciate that, but it was just a matter of time, honestly, before somebody came along and told that story. The day I met you, I knew you had a great story, even just like, on the, you know, topically. Like you had worked with these guys and these guys, and I was like, "Wow, this guy must have some amazing stories." Uh, it took it took a long time to put it together because there are so many people, and I'm just lucky enough to be the guy that got to write the story first. Uh, shame on all the other journalists <laughs> that like that didn't do this. Screw them; it's their loss. Um, and Ernie does have a lot of stories, so many so that this could be a serialization in gold mine that we could do this every month for the entire year and we still wouldn't run out of stuff yeah That's you're probably preaching to the choir with joyce on that because they <laughs> keep sending her an updated list and in fact i just sent you a new one of the you know the next 30 things that we can talk about every week so you know it's there is a lot of stories but you know to what you said Ivor. i don't think anybody could have written the story the way you did it's amazing how he did it because i was when I did read it, and I've read it four or five times now, um, it, the way he did it was very strategic. Taking the art half, hat off and putting the marketing hat on, it was very strategic how he did it and how he, for the first time ever, anywhere, all these different sides of the story get told. And it's left it up to the reader to make the decision of where they want to lie the truth or what they think came first, because right now it's all bits and pieces and it's all over the place. And nobody's telling the story the way Ivor told it in as many different stories about a particular topic, which I was, I was blown away. Really. I had no idea you were going to do that. Well, the only, you know what, the only thing to just to clarify what Ernie is saying, uh, the only thing really that there is a question of is this Rolling Stones logo, the tongue and lips thing that everybody knows, right? Which one came first? Was it Ernie? Was it John Pash or Pache, as some people call him? Um, you know, Craig Braun, of course, Ernie's former employer, had some really uh, obnoxious and funny things <laughs> to say. He basically called Ernie a drug addled windbag. Um who had nothing to do with anything. <laughs> yeah, when I was when I was nobody, I was writing for the LAB, which is the local blog here. That's how I got started. I had written this this story about Ernie, and it was very uh, you know didn't go into any detail, didn't discuss anything really that he had done. It was him talking about the role of the creative director in an agency, and that went out. And somehow Craig Braun saw it and left a comment saying the uh, he basically cut and paste this ernie's a windbag he imagined all this he didn't do any of this stuff and it was such a harsh comment that i didn't allow it to be published with with you know alongside the piece normally i don't edit what people say if they have a response to something i've written if it's good or bad whatever i let them say it. it's free country uh in this case though i didn't let him say that but i kept it i kept the comments and i knew one day that I would write something about Ernie and I would write about this Rolling Stones tongue and there would be challenges to it. And I had, I had this guy's email to prove that he had like done, he had written this years before and we dragged it out and put it in and made it part of the story. 
It's great too, because it, you know, it just, he, he did everything. And actually, you know, and when it comes to the tongue, he was responsible for making the suggestion. He had looked at the lips that I had created for Falls Alive and said, hey, go upstairs in my art department and put a tongue on the outside of these lips. And I think I can sell it to the Stones. Well, unbeknownst to me, even until I read the story that he had actually seen something. Is that how it went, Ivor? That he had seen, he reverse engineered it when he saw what I had done. And and then the yeah. real question is, why did they do more than one? Why? Exactly. Yeah. And there's, that, only, there's only two people that have the answer to that. Marshall Chess and Mick Jagger. And, uh, you know, I know people in the Rolling Stones. I've done a lot of work with the Rolling Stones. Um, but nobody wants to give that question to Mick because he just doesn't do interviews. He could straighten it out for me, but one day. Yeah, well, he did do a thing that we I had seen where he talks about how he went to Pache, you know, to yeah. do it. Um, and you were saying that, you know, they did that so that they wanted somebody that was totally unknown, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so they went to that art school and got him to do it. And actually, Ivor interviewed John Pache, who I guess it's me and Pache. You know, guys like Ruby Mazur and Alan Aldridge, those guys are kind of peripheral and on the sidelines versus the two but and i think part of the reason why the stones really don't weigh in heavily is because they like the controversy when you think about the stones it's always controversial it's all controversial it's always disruptive they try and do that on purpose and i think they like the buzz oh, they, do. they do no doubt they love it they, they did um they did a video i was just watching it the other night for a song called doom and gloom which came off their last album which anybody that's a stones fan knows that their latest album doesn't sell like sticky fingers right nobody does they, you know they get further in their career and there's a video that they had to ban from mtv because they put nudity in it because they're the rolling stones yeah, and sure. the fact that it gets banned is better publicity than the stones just put out a new video who cares yeah 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 you know we did we did an album and you'll see joyce from that list i sent you we did an album for a kid named uh simon stokes and he had a big hit i guess it was in australia and he came here it was called the boa constrictor ate my wife last night and he's this really kind of biker trucker guy and we did an album for him that was called uh simon stokes and the black whip thrill black, band yeah. and it had it was a like a pulp illustration from the 30s of a woman and torture thing with all these guys and he got banned they wouldn't let it be shown because it was like this and we didn't even really think about that when we did it we just you know did it because we wanted to look like a pulp magazine and weird and so yeah the, the weirdest but he got great press out of that great press everybody wanted to see it you know <laughs> so oh and let me just mention you know behind me is since we're talking about the book and uh, and and the and the and the article that Ivor had created. Uh, what you're seeing behind me is the art department at Pacific Ironier in in the early '80s, um, and our view out the window that way was of the Beverly Hills car wash, and uh, we would see all the celebrities bring their cars in and stuff, and it was kind of crazy. And what you see behind me here is me, <laughs> okay, <I love> it. <laughs> and I'm that was 50 years ago. You know, I was 34 years old. You know, it's crazy when you look at this kind of thing and say, oh, my God, you know, and here I am now, you know, 50 years later, you know, <laughs> it's kind of weird. But anyway, uh, that's, you know, and, and so I didn't I didn't mean to go off target here. We we want to talk more a little bit about gold mine. And Ivor, why don't you let us know a little bit about what you hear from that side of the desk, you know, in the buzz. Uh, well, you know, I don't, it's not even a matter of what I hear. It's just a matter of going to gold mines website and looking, uh, going to try and order the magazine online, which you can do. And my editor is a really, first of all, I think my editor is probably the best editor of any music magazine that ever existed. Uh, I've worked with a few different people. Um, I'm not, you know, I, I haven't worked with a ton of editors, but this guy's great. He takes blank, blank, you know, words on a page and he takes them and he turns it into art, which is really great, especially for somebody like Ernie. Yeah. And, uh, you know, he did a really, really great job. Anyways, if you go to the website and you see Ernie's got it uh, in his background there, the, uh -huh. the issue with uh, Licorice Pizza and the one beside it, which is the special, special edition, um, they've already sold out. What he did was um, 
I thought he was going to just put an Ernie print in, and it, you would be it would be totally at random. You don't know what you're getting. And what he did was he chunked it all up so you could order uh, order the pizza girl with whichever print you wanted. So they've already sold out the Stones and the Aerosmith ones. Wow. And yeah. then he went and he took um, he took the one uh, that's got the mosaic on it. And he made these special, special editions that consisted of every print. And when I first saw it, I thought, wow, he's going to get stuck with those. He'll never sell them. They sold out in like a day. They were $129. And they just flew off the shelves, which I knew. I, I knew. Yeah, I he did. Me. He kept telling me, you know, it's going to fly off. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, you know, I don't want to burst your bubble, Ivor. But, you know, the Rolling Stones and some of these other bands, are you kidding me? <laughs> And uh, he got the last laugh. Yeah. Yeah. Which is a good last laugh to have. And mm -hmm. yeah, I just, I mean, this year alone, uh, I did a special slipcase edition. I did one with the Rolling Stones. I did one with Henry Diltz, who is the world's greatest photographer, most well known. He's the guy that did all of Woodstock. Um, and I did another one with Led Zeppelin. You can actually see them all in the background there. And you can still go and buy the Rolling Stones, the Woodstock, and the Led Zeppelin issues. They have not sold them out, but Ernie is quickly on his way to surpassing all of them. That's just that's that's even hard for me to wrap my mind around. You know, I mean, I, I seriously, I'm very humbled by that and what you've said, and and by what you wrote, man. I mean, because uh, you know, Joyce, once it gets past the controversial piece, that's the Rolling Stones piece. The rest of it is just really the way he wove it all together and keeps you interested in reading on. You know, it's for me, it's like you, Joyce, when you play a record, you don't just play the record and you just don't name the group and the song, you know, the song it is. You give history behind it. You make it interesting. You make me want to listen to everything that you have to say about it, because some I already know. But guess what? Every time I listen to you talk about something, I learn something. And I think Ivor has done that. He's been able to. And for me, you know, he said, I'm a writer. I'm not a writer. I lived it. So it's easy. To, it's like a diary. OK, if you read my diary, it's pretty boring. When you read what Ivor wrote, he had the ability to take it and keep it interesting. There's 20 pages and it flows like you just it's one of those things. And, you know, I don't want to sound egotistical because I'm not, but it's no. you just want to keep reading it. You, you, you smile. It's like when I watch your show that even this segment that we do, I can't stop watching it, not because it's me, but because it's entertaining. You know, it makes me smile and I feel good about it. And I think what Ivor has written will make the readers feel really good about it. And, and he's left it up to them on that one controversial thing, because nothing else is controversial. It's only that one thing. And and because we had that letter from Craig and because we had a letter from Shep Gordon to the Academy about who should get the credit for schools out, you know, his editor and rightfully so, you know, he's in a very precarious position because he has to make sure that we're not, we're meaning Ivor and I are using his magazine as a platform to get back at someone. And, and Ivor really sort of stood up and had the evidence that it wasn't. And it's really about telling the story more than anybody's ever heard. And this story about that Stones piece, no one, I don't care who hardcore Rolling Stones fan, because I've seen them on the blog sites, they haven't seen it all in one place. And not that this is everything, but this is the main thing. It's the chicken or the egg. That's how I feel about what he's done. And, and it's up to you to decide which one came first. Both Which are necessary, doesn't, you, know. you know, and it doesn't really matter. And to just to give you a short, uh, a short version of that story and how this all came to be, Mick Jagger had seen the goddess Khalifa or whatever her name was. Shiva. Um, no, yeah, no, that's a marijuana strain. Shiva. Oh Shiva. Sorry about that. I, I started to name the seven dwarfs, but we're good. I won't. I won't put a picture up there because hey, go buy the magazine if you want to see it. Um, but basically, Mick had seen this this drawing of this Indian goddess, and her tongue was like coming out, and it had all these other little tongues coming out, and he liked it, and wanted something similar. He sh he went to the London, uh, some London art school, and said, "Just get me a real rookie guy. I'll show this to him, and I want him to create something like it." 
And he did, and he created the, the Stone's Tongue that's known today, et cetera, et cetera. And then for some reason, Marshall Chess was in New York, and he was at Craig Braun's agency. And for reasons we still don't know, he wanted to duplicate this thing. They did. Basically, what, what happened was Craig Braun had already seen what John Pache did, but Ernie had never seen it. So this is what reverse engineering is. You get someone that's never seen the product you're trying to duplicate. You can describe it to them. Uh, you can talk about it, but you can't show it to them, right? Which basically gives them immunity from ever having copied the original thing. Yeah. And that's what that's what Ernie did. He, was, he, he, he had the Dolls Live thing, and Craig said, hey, can you put a tongue on that? Craig Braun had seen the Pache thing. So Ernie did like he was asked, and um, Craig Braun hopped in a cab, took it over to, I guess, Atlantic Records. Is that where he no, took it? No, to Andy Warhol's factory. Oh, okay. Came back and said, congratulations, you just you did the Rolling Stones logo. So now there's two logos. Why did there need to be two logos? We don't know. But fast forward to last summer, there's a guy by the name of Matt Lee who lives in London, he is the world's biggest collector of Stone's memorabilia. So much so that uh, about five years ago, the Rolling Stones decided they wanted to put on a traveling show called Exhibitionism. And it's got all this rare stuff, it's guitars, stage outfits, recording contracts, all this. They, they, had restaged, the they restaged their apartment, right? With the food on yeah. the table and everything, yeah. the section of it, yeah. So they had to go to this guy, Matt Lee, and borrow from his collection. If you can imagine that. Oh my God. Like, so anytime the Rolling Stones want something that's really big, they have to go to Matt Lee and they make a deal for it and they borrow it, take it, take it on the road. Well, if there's anybody in the world that knows everything about the Rolling Stones, it's Matt Lee. And we corroborated our stories together when I was in England last summer for a Stone show. Um, and we, we basically agreed on it. Because if Matt, you know, if anybody knows, Matt Lee does. And that's uh, that's what went into the issue. Yeah, and he has a whole display case with the version that I did in it with all the belt buckles and different badges and stuff because I spent a couple of months just doing all the merch, roach clips and big foil, uh, like foil board uh, stock with uh, black and red and white ink printed on it and they were die cut and they just put them in the record stores. Didn't even say Rolling Stones. It was just a big tongue. You know, we did hundreds of those. It was amazing. You know, all the merchandise. And so mine ended up being on the merch and John Pache's ended up being on the album and both are used. They're still used to this day. And I think that's one of the things that most people don't realize is that both those versions, not Ruby Mazur, not Alan Aldridge, not any of these other guys that they want to give credit to, both those were used at the exact same time. One was on the Sticky Finger album. One was used on all the merchandise for the tour. So, you know, it's again, it's the chicken and the egg. I don't really care which one I was. It's nice to be one of two, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And having yeah. this article in Goldmine is wonderful because, you know, Ernie, you had mentioned about the Internet. And then so much gets interjected online and then it just further enmeshes things. So with this article in Goldmine, people can read it and then, you know, make the decision for themselves with, yeah. with good factual information. Yeah, and he was good at doing that. I mean, I wasn't expecting that. Uh, for some reason, I wasn't expecting it. I wasn't expecting what he ended up doing. But the way he did it, I could see how, first of all, I could see how somebody could take that the wrong way. Mm -hmm. And, you know, his editor had all the rights in the world to feel that and question that. And then there was another question about, uh, what was it, Ivor, that he didn't believe that one person could have done all those album covers or something? The discography, yeah. When he said somebody's discography, when I sent him a list and it had like 260 some odd albums on it and he you know he immediately he's like that's that's impossible no, no one guy could have had that kind of legacy and uh i was like check it out right wow. and he's got access to you know whatever and he was like wow he couldn't believe it now i'm sending him to ivor i'm going on google and finding <laughs> him and sending him to him and you know and i think about 160 albums in his editor said okay you know uncle go ahead and do it yeah. And, and, you know, kudos to his editor 
uh, for understanding from a lot more perspectives and being open enough to listen and also to his art department. You know, those that guy, that creative director out there and their team is a small team, but it's tight and they really know what they're doing and doing a magazine across 20 pages, well, across 50 pages or however many pages are in that magazine. That's a hard thing to do to keep somebody's interest, to stop them when you want to stop them, you know, and, and keep them involved as you read because people don't read anymore. You know, it's all about the internet and, you know, 15 yeah. second little snippets and then they form opinions, you know, but again, and that was the thing that for me was, and I've read, like I said, I've read Ivor's article, of, you know, maybe six, seven times now. And, and it, it keeps your interest. It really does. It's like in a, the comparison I was making with you, Joyce, every song you play, you educate, you entertain and you educate. Ivor entertained and educated and left it up to the viewer. It's awesome. Yeah. yeah. And that's well, the way it should be. Yeah. Yeah. Goldmine's yeah. a special magazine. Um, you know, we are, we are the collector's resource. We have been since 1974. If you want to know anything about the value of your collection, you would go to Goldmine. It's always been, I mean, Goldmine used to basically just publish lists of records and like what they were worth for collectors. And it's changed. That's how they started? Yeah. Huh. Yeah. And it's, you know, over the years it's changed. We're the second biggest magazine in the United States mm -hmm. after, after Rolling Stone, which I think is just a lifestyle magazine. Yeah. Yeah, um, it's gone I, to that. Yeah, yeah. yeah right. Only you know now. Now people look back and go, "Oh, you know, Rolling Stone wrote they wrote all this great stuff." Well, you know what, Rolling Stone, to to quote from Almost Famous, they broke up Cream. They trashed every album Led Zeppelin ever did. They, they just you know they had good writers, but they wrote a lot of garbage. And yeah. then over time, they started just writing and putting actors on the covers of the magazines. And today. They are nothing but a lifestyle magazine. Yon Wonder sold the whole thing. It's owned by some some Saudi uh, family, and you have to actually pay them to write for them. So really, oh, wow! Yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah. So as far as I'm concerned, I'm with the number one magazine. Yeah. Well, you know, kudos to that magazine, the editor, the art department guy. I can't uh, talk about. I like. I'm very picky about people taking stuff that I've done and redoing it. Yeah. And, and trying to make it similar. It's happened with the Bee Gees. It's happened with, you know, Alice. It's, it's happened with a bunch of stuff where people just try and imitate it, emulate it, and just always fall short. And, you know, uh, that guy in their art department that did the layouts for this, I mean, I would hire him. If, if I was hiring somebody, I would hire him. You know, I mean, the guy is really great. And, and the editor is really great giving direction. To me, the editor is like a creative director. That's what I am. I don't sit there and do everything. I have people that can do it. I have the Ivers and I have the Bob Ingalls Evers and I have the people that know how to do it. I don't even try and fool myself anymore to thinking that I could do what they do. You know, I, if I write, I write out a necessity, you know, but now that Ivers come into my life, I don't need to do that anymore. And he just, you know, he writes so much better than I, it's the same with Drew. I thought I was an illustrator. You guys, I thought I was an illustrator. And then all of a sudden, Drew Struzan came along, Joe Garnett came along, Bill, you know, Bob, uh, Bill Garland, Carl Ramsey. I was no illustrator. You know, I was a hack. These guys were these guys were amazing. And each one of those people went on to become very well known. Actually, Drew would be number one. And then, you know, Bill Garland, because whatever movie poster Drew didn't get, Bill got. It was, it was like that. It was like them being back at Pacific Iron Ear. We had had that conversation. We got together a few times after they went to work for Seiniger, which was the big company, and, and I stayed with Pacific Iron Ear. And, uh, you know, I, I got a couple of offers, but I would never consider them because I, I, the thing I learned was once you work for somebody and you go work for yourself and then you try and go back and work for somebody, it never works. No. no. It never works. It's like... You just, it won't, it, you can't make the, the reason why we started Pacific Ioneer was because we didn't like the way clients were treated by the guy we worked for. And we didn't like the way the business was done and we wanted to do it better. We wanted to do it different. And we decided that no matter who we went to work for, because we were going to go our separate ways, it would end up the same way. We'd, we'd spend two or three years and we'd be right back where we were, were that night. 
Yeah. And so, yeah. you know, we decided, okay, you know, we're just going to not even try. Three, oh, yeah, three, you're getting the uh, signal. You oh, know, yeah, yeah. Uh, the, uh, the good old signal, you know, yeah. the, uh, for, from uh, Zoom as we do our interviews here, which is Yeah, wonderful. so I'm going to shut any up and party, I'm going to... Any we got, we got five minutes, right? Five we got minutes. Five minutes. Oh, good, okay, five, Iver, good minutes. You're on, Iver. Uh, I'm on? You're on. <laughs> well, you got to ask me a question. I just well, Joyce, Joyce, you're any, on with him. Ask him any a question. parting thoughts, Ivor, that you'd like to interject? Uh, well, I don't have parting thoughts, especially when it comes to Ernie, uh, because <laughs> this is him. something that it's not going to part. It's just going to keep going. Um, it will. Be, it will be serialized. We will continue to write about Ernie because he's got great stories. He's got stories, and you know, yeah, there's a lot of people with great great stories out there but i always like to say that uh, you know when you interview paul mccartney you're interviewing one rock star when you talk to ernie you're interviewing 30 of them all at the same time yes you know i know i know a question you could ask him joyce yeah and one one that's always appropriate for us on the name on the block um what so, what Rolling Stone songs would you like to choice to play? I gotta be like Carol Burnett, okay? What Rolling Stone songs, Ivor, would you That's like easy. for me to play? Fingerprint file and slave. Really? I never heard of either one of those. <laughs> what 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 again? Fingerprint file and slave. I have some okay. knowledgeable people here. Whoa. Oh. I'm not blown away. Oh, yeah. If you want to know anything about the Rolling Stones. Yeah. I, can, I consider myself somewhat of an expert on it. And what he's forgotten, his wife Susan remembers, because she's even a bigger expert on all that stuff. Oh, yeah. <laughs> my. Yeah. They must caused a riot in Baltimore in the early days. It was in their second appearance, and my father was an usher at the Baltimore Civic Center. He worked that show, and he said it was just total bedlam. Really? It, was, it was yeah they were like you said controversy from the early days and even on so yeah. lots of great stories gold mine such a respected publication thank you so much Ivor. i'm so glad we finally had a chance to have my you pleasure here on the block party yeah well you'll be hearing you'll be hearing of him a lot late in the next coming months and years because we're on our way to a documentary and a book so we're that we're thinking about all that that yeah. is great. That is great. You know, just thank you so much and for the wonderful contribution. And you too, Ernie, you're going to be on the corner for a very long time. Oh, I, I bought, I bought a place on the corner. You know, I'm <laughs> yeah, not moving. Estate. I'm going to build, I got a lean to I'm starting with, and then I'm going to build a, a castle.